Good morning, Madison County Elementary. It's Mr. Lawrence. Today I'm going to be reading to you the first little bit of The Hobbit, one of my favorite books. When I was in the second grade, my aunt bought me this very copy, and my mom and I read it at bedtime every night until we'd finished it. That's part of the reason that I decided to become an English teacher, was because this book helped jumpstart my love of reading. I'm going to read a little bit of it every day and send it to Ms. Kleckler so that we can read through it together. And we can also talk about plot, setting, characters, and other literary elements and things like that that we've been studying this year. The Hobbit, Chapter 1, An Unexpected Party. In a hole in the ground, there lived a hobbit. Not a nasty, dirty, wet hole filled with the ends of worms and an oozy smell, nor yet a dry, bare, sandy hole with nothing in it to sit on or to eat. It was a hobbit hole, and that means comfort. It had a perfectly round door like a porthole, painted green with a shiny yellow brass knob in the exact middle. The door opened onto a tube-shaped hall like a tunnel, a very comfortable tunnel without smoke, with paneled walls and floors tiled and carpeted, provided with polished chairs and lots and lots of pegs, for hats and coats. The Hobbit was very fond of visitors. The tunnel wound on and on, going fairly but not quite straight into the side of the hill. The hill, as all the people for many, many miles around called it, and many little round doors opened out of it, first on one side and then on another. No going upstairs for the Hobbit. Bedrooms, bathrooms, cellars, pantries, wardrobes, kitchens, Dining rooms all were on the same floor, and indeed on the same passage. The best rooms were all on the left-hand side, going in, for these were the ones that have windows, deep-set round windows looking over his garden, and meadows beyond, sloping down to the river. The hobbit was a very well-to-do hobbit, and his last name was Baggins. The Bagginses had lived in the neighborhood of the hill for time out of mind, and people considered them very respectable, not only because most of them were rich, but also because they never had any adventures or did anything unexpected. You could tell what a Baggins would say on any question without the bother of asking him. This is a story of how a Baggins had an adventure and found himself doing and saying things altogether unexpected. He may have lost the neighbor's respect, but he gained, well, You'll see whether he gained anything or not in the end. The mother of our particular hobbit, oh, what is a hobbit? I suppose hobbits need some description now, since they have become rather rare and shy of the big folk, as they call us. They are a little people, about half our height, and smaller than the bearded dwarves. Hobbits have no beards. There is no little to no magic about them except the ordinary everyday sort, which helps them to disappear quietly and quickly when large stupid folk like you and me come blundering along, making a noise like elephants, which they can hear a mile off. They are inclined to be fat in the stomach. They dress in bright colors, chiefly greens and yellows, wear no shoes because their feet grow natural leathery soles and thick warm brown hair, like the stuff on their heads, which is curly. They have long, clever brown fingers, good-natured faces, and laugh deep, fruity laughs, especially after dinner, which they have twice a day when they can. Now you know enough to go on with. As I was saying, the mother of this hobbit, of Bilbo Baggins, that is, was the fabulous Belladonna Took, one of the three remarkable daughters of the old Took, head of the hobbits who lived across the water, the small river that ran at the foot of the hill, it was often said in other families that long ago, one of the Took ancestors must have taken a fairy wife. That was, of course, absurd, but certainly there was still something not entirely Hobbit-like about them. And once in a while, members of the Took clan would go and have adventures. They discreetly disappeared and the family hushed it up. But the fact remained that the Tooks were not as respectable as the Bagginses though they were undoubtedly richer. Not that Belladonna Took ever had any adventures after she became Mrs. Bungo Baggins' wife. Bungo, that was Bilbo's father, built the most luxurious hobbit hole for her, 
that was to be found either under the hill or over the hill or even across the water. And there, and there they remained to the end of their days. Still, it is probable that Bilbo, her only son, although he looked and behaved exactly like his father, got something a bit strange in his makeup from the Took side, something that only waited for a chance to come out. The chance never arrived until Bilbo Baggins was grown up, being about 50 years old or so, and living in the beautiful hobbit hole built by his father, which I have just described to you, until he had in fact apparently settled down immovably. By some curious chance one morning, long ago in the quiet of the world, when there was less noise and more green, and the hobbits were still numerous and prosperous, Bilbo Baggins was standing at his door after breakfast, smoking an enormously long wooden pipe that reached nearly down to his woolly toes. Gandalf came by. Gandalf. If you had heard only a quarter of what I have heard about him, and I have only heard very little of all there is to hear, you would be prepared for any sort of remarkable tale. Tales and adventures sprouted up all over the place wherever he went in the most extraordinary fashion. He hadn't been seen down that way, under the hill, for ages and ages, not since his friend, the old Took, died. In fact, the hobbits had almost forgotten what he looked like. He'd been away over the hill and across the water on businesses of his own, since they were all small hobbit boys and hobbit girls. All that the unsuspecting Bilbo, Bilbo saw that morning was an old man with a staff. He had a tall, pointed blue hat, a long gray cloak, and a silver cart, scarf over which a white beard hung down below his waist and immense black boots. Good morning, said Bilbo, and he meant it. The sun was shining and the grass was very green, but Gandalf looked at him from under long, bushy eyebrows that stuck out further than the brim of his shady hat. What do you mean, he said. Do you wish me a good morning, or mean that it is a good morning whether I want it or not, or that you feel good this morning, and that it is morning to be good on? Um, all at once, said Bilbo, and a very fine morning for a pipe of tobacco out of doors. Into the bargain? If you have a pipe about you, sit down and have some of mine. There's no hurry, and we have all day before us. Then Bilbo sat down on a seat by his door, crossed his legs, and blew out a beautiful gray ring of smoke that sailed up into the air without breaking and floated away over the hill. Hm, very pretty, said Gandalf, but I have no time to blow smoke rings this morning. I'm looking for someone to share in an adventure that I'm arranging, and it's very difficult to find anyone. I should think so in these parts. We're plain, quiet folk and have no use of adventure. Nasty, disturbing, uncomfortable things make you late for dinner. I can't think what anybody sees in them, said our Mr. Baggins, and stuck one thumb behind his braces. Then he blew an even bigger smoke ring. Then he looked out his morning, took out his morning letters and began to read, pretending to take no notice of the old man. He had decided that he was not quite his sort and wanted him to just go away. But the old man did not move. He stood leaning on his stick and gazing at the hobbit without saying anything, till Bilbo got quite uncomfortable and even a little cross. Good morning, he said at last. We don't want any adventures here. Thank you. You might try over the hill or maybe across the water. By this, he meant that the conversation was at an end. What a lot of things you use good morning for, said Gandalf. You mean that you want to get rid of me and that it won't be good till I move on. Uh, not at all, not at all, good sir. Let me see, I don't think I know your name. Yes, yes, my dear sir, and I do know yours, Mr. Bilbo Baggins. And you do know my name, though you don't remember that I belong to it, or that it belongs to me. I am Gandalf, and Gandalf means me. To think that I should have lived to be good morning by Belladonna Took's son as if I was selling buttons at his door. Gandalf? Gandalf? Good gracious me, 
not the wandering wizard that gave old Took a pair of magic diamond studs that fastened themselves and never came undone till ordered? Not the fellow who used to tell such wonderful tales at parties about dragons and goblins and giants and the rescue of princesses and the unexpected luck of widow's sons? Not the man that used to make such particularly excellent fireworks. I remember those. Old Took used to have them on Midsummer's Eve. Oh, splendid. They used to go up like great lilies and snapdragons and labradorms of fire and hang in the twilight all evening. You will notice already that Mr. Baggins was not quite so prosy as he liked to believe, also that he was very fond of flowers. Dear me, he went on, not the Gandalf, who was responsible for so many quiet lads and lasses going off into the blue on crazy adventures, anything from climbing trees to visiting the elves, or sailing in ships, sailing to other places. Bless me. Life used to be quiet in her, um, I mean... You used to upset things badly in these parts once upon a time. I beg your pardon, but I had no idea that you were still in business. Huh, <laughs> where else would I be, said the wizard. All the same, I'm pleased to find you remember something about me. You seem to remember my fireworks kindly. At any rate, and this is not without hope. Indeed, for your old grandfather Took's sake, and for the sake of poor Belladonna, your grandmother, I will give you what you ask for. I beg your pardon? I haven't asked for anything. Yes, you have. Twice now. My pardon, and I give it to you. In fact, I will go so far as to send you on this adventure. Very amusing for me, very good for you, and profitable too, very likely, if you ever get over it. Uh, sorry. I don't want any adventures. Thank you. Not today. Good morning. Please come by for tea. Anytime you like. Why not tomorrow? Come tomorrow. Goodbye. And with that, the hobbit turned and scuttled inside in his round green door and shut it quickly behind him, trying not to seem rude. Wizards, after all, are wizards. What on earth did I ask him to tea for, he said to himself as he went to the pantry. He had only just had breakfast, but he thought a cake or two and a drink of something would do him good after his fright. Gandalf, in the meantime, was still standing outside the door and laughing long but quietly. After a while, he stepped up, and with the spike on his staff, scratched a strange sign on the hobbit's beautiful green door. Then he strode away, just about the time when Bilbo was finishing his second cake, and, the beginning, and beginning to think that he had escaped adventures very well. So this book is a fantasy. I know a lot of our classes have been talking about genre lately. And this was written by J.R.R. Tolkien, and he is what we consider the father of modern fantasy. I'm dressed a little strange today. I am dressed in medieval clothing from one of my hobbies where we recreate the Middle Ages. Uh, a lot of the inspiration for this fantasy and for early works of fantasy came from authors like J.R.R. Tolkien and C.S. Lewis because they were in fact professors of history. So they took the historical references, like what I'm wearing today, and turned those into stories from another place and time that included magic and wizards like Gandalf, hobbits like Bilbo, and dragons like we'll meet later on. So I hope you join us tomorrow when we finish up Chapter 2. Thanks for watching. Bye, guys.